100H. Um, this is our new viable sampler from Lighthouse. Um, originally, several months ago, we came out with the Active Count 100. This is the H version, and we'll talk about some of the differences um, in the product. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through a, a, a complete presentation. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask Tom to unmute everybody. And if that works, because that will allow everybody to ask questions as we go through. Um, so we'll try that. If there's too much background noise, then Tom can probably mute everybody. He's currently, I believe, got control of the webinar. And if not, we'll just keep All right, so we're just going to go this route. I've, uh, I keep getting muted somehow. Sorry for the technical difficulties this morning. So I'm going to assume everybody can hear me, and we're going to get rolling. So um, you can see here on this home screen, um, the Active Count 100H is ISO 14698 compliant, and we'll get into what that means. Uh, it has HEPA filtered exhaust, and that's something that's unique about this about the H version over the uh, main version over the original version, the Active Count 100. Um, the unit has continuous. <laughs> The unit has continuous and periodic sampling, a removable petri dish holder, and that is unique for the H. Um, it is suitable for aseptic environments, and it does have a gas um, and remote sampling options. So hopefully everybody is aware that viable sampling really is a mission critical component of any environmental monitoring program within the life science industry. Um, of course, they're concerned with different types of particulates. We could break things into viable and non-viable, um, and they're definitely concerned with both viable or the live particles, non-viable or the dead particles. Um, but from a microbial standpoint, I mean, obviously the, the, the key concern is the live stuff because that's the stuff that if it gets with inside uh, the products being manufactured can grow and actually cause damage to the people taking the product. So I want to make it clear we really understand the unique challenges of proper sampling and we're going to go through that now. So we're going to start by a quick overview on the market and talk about uh, what markets we can sell into, um, what standards are out in the industry right now, and then we'll go a little further into the guidelines environmental compatibility of our new instrument, ease of use, we'll have a competitor overview, and then a summary. So I guess you can hold your questions till the end and or type your questions and I'll pull them up at the end. So let's get started, guys. So the main markets for this product really are the compounding labs, anything to do within the pharmaceutical manufacturing environments, whether it's aseptic or not, Medical device manufacturing, uh, viable sampling is done in hospitals, food and beverage industry, the agriculture industry. Uh, it's also done in indoor air quality. But for our main markets, which we can see here, compounding, pharmaceutical, medical device, hospitals, food and beverage, and agriculture. So it's got a pretty broad base of potential markets. So I was going to originally ask everybody what this number meant, but because you're all muted, then nobody can actually answer. Um, if anybody wants to try and type and respond to this specific numbers and let me know what you think two to one means, I'll give you five seconds right now. And we'll count down. Five, four, three, two, one. Come on, I don't see any type messages. We've got to participate out there, guys and girls. So the answer to the question is two to one. What does that mean? For every portable particle counter that is sold into the life science industry, in general, two viable samplers are purchased. So one particle counter, two viable samplers are purchased. So to, just to give you a reference number, 
Um, we have a major pharmaceutical account that we are going after right now. <laughs> I'm getting a text from Marcel. Is this a quote? Um, this particular customer has 800 portables and over 1,600 viable samplers. So I'm trying to give you a scope of how large this potential market is. So two to one. Every time you sell a portable instrument, you should be able to sell two or more viable samplers. So viable sampling guidelines. So what's next here is we're going to cover the industry guidelines slash regulations that govern viable sampling. So there is USP 1116. Um, this specific standards, this is United States Pharmacopeia, um, provides general information and recommendations uh, for environments where risk of microbial contamination is controlled through aseptic processing. And we're also going to talk a little bit about ISO 14698, which really describes the principles and basic, basic methodology for formal system to assess and control biocontamination where cleaner technology is applied. So USP 1116 states, there are no standard methods for air sampling, and available literature indicates that air sampling methods are highly variable. So what they're talking about here is depending on the type of microbial sampling that you're doing, everything from uh, uh, just a simple uh, impaction plate that you put out for up to four hours to um, using some type of uh, filtration method where you're actually capturing viable uh, particles on a filter, or you're using an impaction method like we're discussing today. And even within the impaction method itself, um, there are variances in results from company to company. Um, 1116 also states routine microbial monitoring should provide sufficient information to demonstrate that the aseptic processing environment is operating in an adequate state of control. Finally, USP does not provide any specifications for impaction sampling. What I mean by that is there's no specific functionality guidelines um, there's no specific um, air speed guidelines for sampling, um, so they don't get into um, things like, you know, impaction efficiency, uh, speed of air, um, how easy the unit should be to function. So it's very limited in its um, description of these types of items. However, ISO 14698 does provide more detail as to the functionality of an impact sampler. So it's, it's still general, but does provide more detail. So ISO 14698 states um, the unit needs to have appropriate suction and flow rate for low levels of viable particles. So what they're referring to here is obviously in an aseptic environment, um, you have a very low microbial count. Um, they're, they want to make sure that whatever instrumentation you use to capture those microbes um, has a sufficient flow rate that you can see hopefully some, well, hopefully not, some level of microbial contamination. Um, there needs to be an appropriate impaction um, air velocity. Unfortunately, what they don't state what that is. What they're talking about here is um, as the air gets pulled through um, the stainless steel or aluminum sampling head and impacts onto the surface of the auger or petri dish, um, if you sample, if the air is moving too quickly, you can actually kill microbes. If the air is moving too slowly, um, a lot of the microbial contamination has a chance of actually following the airflow path and not impacting onto the surface of the petri dish. They talk about collection accuracy uh, and efficacy. And, and again, that's sort of what we just spoke about where uh, you don't want to impact too quickly or too slowly. Again, they don't state, however, what that accuracy or efficacy is. They talk about ease of handling from a weight and size and operation standpoint, including auxiliary equipment. So they do state that the unit should be easy to handle and operate. It should be easy to clean and disinfect and sterilize. 
and possible intrinsic addition of viable particles to the area being measured. What they're talking about here is they want to make sure that the viable sampler does not contaminate the environment that it's actually sampling in. Some very specific statements that they make, which will be key and you will be tested on at the end of this presentation. Um, ISO 14698 states the exhaust air from the sampling device should not contaminate the environment being sampled or be reaspirated by the sampling device. So this really directly implies that the exhaust should be filtered. Right, so the exhaust coming out of the instrument really should be filtered to be compliant with ISO 14698. Impaction velocity of the air hitting the culture medium is a compromise between being high enough to allow entrapment of particles down to approximately one micron and low enough to ensure viability um, of viable particles by avoiding mechanical damage or breakup of clumps. So this second part again means that you don't want to impact those viable counts onto the plate too hard or you have the opportunity to actually kill them. So these two things are key. One, filtered exhaust. Two, being able to sample down to uh, one micron in size. So why is filtered exhaust important? Well, for obvious reasons, right? The exhaust should not spread microbes. So you can imagine if I'm in an aseptic environment and I'm moving from, um, let's say I'm in a 503B compounding facility and I'm moving, I'm moving from laminar flow bench to laminar flow bench. I want to make sure that I don't pick up some type of contamination in one bench and then spread it to another. Another example is even when I'm outside of the bench. Let's say I'm in an ISO class 7 environment and I'm transporting my, my microbial sampler from location to location. Well, when I'm moving it, obviously air is impacting onto its surface. I want to make sure that that air doesn't get released and actually contaminate the next location. So the idea behind filtered exhaust is to really reduce the possibility of cross-contamination between sample location to sample location. And again, ISO states the exhaust air from the sampling device should not contaminate the environment being sampled. The reason I'm stressing this is there's several competitors on the market, and we'll highlight that at the end of the presentation, that do not filter exhaust air. They claim ISO 14698 compliance. However, they do not filter the air, so they are not truly compliant. And from what I hear um, from feet on the street in the industry, meaning me going into customer sites, um, a lot of companies have not had the awareness that they're not having a filtered exhaust. So companies like SAS, which is the yellow colored viable sampler, and I've got pictures of that at the end of the presentation, is not HEPA filtered. MBV, the MASS 100, the ECO, the NT, all of them are not HEPA filtered. Between those two companies, at least in the U.S., those are the two number one companies in viable sampling. So what that means for us is it's really an open market for us to go in and start taking the business away from our competitors. So we're going to talk for a second about D50 and what is D50 because this uh, terminology will most likely come up at some point when you're presenting to um, the industry. So the D50 is the 50% cutoff particle size where 50% of the particles are likely to be impacted and 50% are likely to pass through the air sampler. Hence, the D50 can be seen as the resolution of the air sampler, the smallest particle size that can be physically that can physically be captured by the sampler. So if you imagine um, as air is coming through the sampler, the top head of the sampler, right, there's a petri dish inside, and some air obviously goes around the petri dish, and some air is impacted onto the petri dish, or I should say some particulate is impacted onto the petri dish. So the D50, at some particle size, 
you're impacting 50% of those particles coming through the instrument. So if we refer back to ISO 14698, remember it states being the airflow needs to be high enough so that you're entrapping particles approximately down to one micron. So the assumed position here is that the D50 should be one micron or approximately one micron. So again, the D50 is where half the particles at a specific minimum particle size are impacting onto the surface of the Petri dish. That's the D50. And here's a picture to sort of help illustrate. So as this is a cross section of an impactor, a stainless steel or aluminum impactor, as the air comes through and you can see the blue lines of the airflow, um, some of the smaller particles actually will go around and follow the flow stream. The larger particles due to mass impact onto the surface. So the point here is that we want to make sure that at least 50% of particles one micron and larger are actually impacting onto the surface of the plate. That's your D50 target. This is the D50 um, information for the active count 100 and active count 100H. So this is the collection efficiency on the left. This is particle size in microns on the bottom. And we can see here that we cross-sect this 50% point with our design at 1.05 micron. I can safely say that that is an excellent resolution. So we meet the ISO requirement for impaction efficiency. This is very key. So we are absolutely positively compliant because they state one micron, they say approximately one micron, and definitely 1.05 qualifies as approximate. So we are absolutely compliant with the industry regulations. Um, so we've developed, so that gives you a little bit of an overview about the standards. We talked about D50, the importance of HEPA filtered exhaust. So now what we want to go into is during a presentation, really there's three key questions that you want to ask to set the stage to make sure we win these orders. And we're going to break these down for you. So the three key questions are, is my sampler compliant with industry regulations or industry guidelines? Is my sampler compatible with the environment that I'm using it in? And how easy is my sampler to use and to maintain? So again, I want to emphasize this point. During a presentation, in order to control the playing field or control the rules of the game for competition, we really want to ask these three questions because we want to force our competitors to have to answer these questions when they come in. So step one, industry guidelines and compliance. So I'm going to remind you again, 14698, the three um, predominant items from 14698 are filtered exhaust. It talks about no reaspiration of sample air. So what that means is that air that you exhaust should not come back around and be resampled by the instrument. So it states no reaspiration of air and a D50 of approximately one micron. Those are the three key guidelines. So the active count 100H has a HEPA filtered exhaust. It is a true HEPA filter. You'll see some companies will state filtered exhaust, but they won't state HEPA filter, we actually have a true removal efficiency of 99.97% of all particles 0.3 micron and larger. We take the extra step, and I know this may be a little hard to see, but what you're looking at is a test chamber that was designed by engineering. Every single active count 100H that comes out of the factory is tested prior to finishing its calibration. So what happens here is this is a test chamber. The instrument is inserted into the test chamber. There is an impaction head that has a, a, a top cover 
that's sampling ambient air. Here's your ambient air sampling inlet. Air is coming into the instrument, is impacting onto the surface of the instrument, and then is actually being exhausted and blown out the exhaust vents which are HEPA filter. We then have a particle canner. In this particular case, we have a 3200, and it is sampling air out of the box. We're actually looking at ambient particle conditions. We then install the instrument inside the sampling chamber, and we look at counts, and we compare the two, and we make sure that it is performing to HEPA filter standards. I can guarantee you that we are the only company in the industry that is going to this length to make sure that these instruments are not cross-contaminating or adding contamination into a critical manufacturing environment. This is a key point, right? We're the only company that's actually going to this level of detail to ensure that we are A, compliant, and B, that we are not causing false counts or providing contempt or cross-contamination into critical manufacturing environments. So we are HEPA filtered exhaust. We've also done re-aspiration tests, and yes, I'll work to get a better picture, but what you're looking at here is this is the active count 100 or 100H. Here at the top, we have a, a fogging system, and we're blowing fog into the instrument, and then you can see the airstream coming out. So there has been no air that is recirculating back into the unit, so we do not re-aspirate air. So again, we meet ISO 14698, and our D50 cutoff is 1.05 micron. So on those three critical guidelines, we are compliant across the board, and that's really your message, is that a lot of companies claim ISO 14698 compliance, but truly they're picking a small piece of the standard and saying, oh, we're compliant to one of these things and using that as a general term. So it's important that you walk the customer through this presentation step by step to explain actually what compliance truly means. So summary, HEPA filtered exhaust, we don't re-aspirate air, and our D50 is 1.05 micron. So congratulations, great job engineering, we are compliant, to ISO 14698. Next, we're going to talk about environmental compatibility of the instrument. What this is referring to is the instrument designed to be compliant with the environments that it is going to be working within. So equipment should be specifically designed to operate within a critical manufacturing environment of the life science industry. Equipment needs to be chemically compatible with the various bio-decontamination materials used, and it cannot add to the contamination levels within the environment. So number one, we're HEPA filtered exhaust. We're going to make sure we drive this point home because it really is a differentiation factor for several of the largest competitors on the market. Number two, here's a material summary. So the active count is standard, and I'm going to repeat, this is critical, it comes standard with a stainless steel dust cover, impaction, and body is all 316L stainless steel. It has an anodized aluminum with a PTFE coating on the handle, the base, and the top plate, right? So these have a PTFE coating that provides additional information for the anodized aluminum. For the majority of the unit, it is absolutely 316L stainless steel, and it comes standard with these materials. Now, there are other companies that offer stainless steel impaction heads, but you have to pay attention. Their base price includes an aluminum head, not a stainless steel head. Their base price often does not include a dust cover. So these are differentiation features that you need to point out. We are, the H is absolutely 316L stainless steel. We've designed the unit so it's got wipe downable joints, a wipe downable touchscreen, sealed power switch, 
It's got a sealed power and USB port in the back, and it has rounded corners for easy wipe down ability. So when we talk about environmental compatibility, one of the key features is, is it easy to clean? And the answer is yes. Rounded corners, stainless steel, wipe downable enclosure. So chemically compatibility, it is compatible with spore cleanse, 70% IPA, bleach, hydrogen peroxide, and VHP. These are all really the most common materials used from a biodecontamination standpoint in the manufacturing process. So yes, we are chemically compatible. Isokinetic sampling. I'm hoping everybody on this call, because of your particle counting experience, understands when I say isokinetic sampling. In brief summary, isokinetic sampling, the purpose of isokinetic sampling is to make sure that you're not uh, interfering with the unidirectional flow of the air coming from the filter. It could be a fan filter unit, uh, HEPA filter, OPA filter. Typical flow rates are 0.35 to 0.45 meters a second. Our unit sits almost smack in the middle at 0.41 meters a second. So we can explain to customers that we are isokinetically sampling, which means we have minimal disruption of the environment that we are sampling in. How easy is the microbial sampler to use, right? Big thumbs up. So one of the differentiation factors of this unit over the main two competitors, really, which has been MBV, again, the MBV uh, MAS100 NT and ECO, and the SAS unit, which is the yellow unit, is our touchscreen interface. This touchscreen interface allows users to more easily and more quickly program the instrument. So you can see here, we're just pointing out a few of the main features on the front of the screen. You've got your settings menu, configuration menu, your log file, start, stop function, locations, users. Obviously across the top here, this is showing the volume of air that you're gonna sample. This is your airflow status, instrument status. This is a USB key status. It shows here that you're plugged into power and your battery currently, while you're plugged into power, you're also recharging the battery. The battery is currently at a 79% charge time. Here in the center, you've got your countdown timer that shows you the time remaining for the sample. You've also got um, your sample status here that shows you how far along in the sample you are. And you can see here actually we're in periodic mode. So we've done, and I'll explain what periodic mode means in the presentation. We have taken four of a total of 10 samples and we've accumulated 49 liters of air. These two bars will actually grow as you are continuously sampling. We have a date, a time, a user and a location name. So this interface, literally, you can train somebody how to use this interface within 10 minutes. It's extremely easy to use. So we zoom in here. Again, we have a, this is your countdown timer and delay timer. Again, another countdown timer with a status bar. This indicates the number of cycles completed in a periodic sampling mode and total volume sampled so far. Next, um, we're at the settings menu, which is here, which is demonstrated by the three lines and the three dots. Once we get into our settings menu, we can change things like our date, our time. Um, you can go into the options menu and change things like the beep, loudness, the, uh, the brightness of the screen. We can look at an overall status of the instrument. We can go into a gas sampling mode, or we have a service screen. Now this service screen is password protected and it's specifically for uh, servicing and calibrating of the instrument. So that's not a password that we would normally give out. You have the home button, which takes you back to the home screen. And you have the information button, which gives you information like the serial number, the calibration date, and the firmware information of the instrument. So this is your settings menu. 
This is your configuration menu. Your configuration menu, you can see we have three options here. We have the sampling mode, and you have three sampling modes. You can be a constant, periodic, and gas sampling. You can program a specific sample volume, and you can set a delay time. The delay time works exactly like it does for a particle counter. Let's say I want to set up a sample and I want to walk away from the sample so I don't contaminate the sample myself. So this is part of the configuration menu. Now you can see here as the modes that I talked about, we have constant sampling mode. Now in constant sampling mode, once you hit the, the play or start button, the unit will continuously sample until the sample volume is achieved. That's constant mode. We have a periodic mode, which allows the user to space out its sample over the course of a spe specified period of time. You know, we have a slide that's going to cover what periodic mode is. You can see here, once we're in periodic mode, you still have your common volume. So you pick your volume of air that you want to sample. You still have your delay time that allows you to walk away from the instrument so you don't contaminate the environment. You have your overall sample time. What this means is it's the entire period of time that the end user wants to take this sample. So for example here, we're going to sample a cubic meter or a thousand liters of air and we're going to sample it over a 20-minute period of time. Then we can enter the number of samples in that period of time that I want to break this sample into. So in this case, five. So the, inner, the, the user enters the mode, the volume, the delay, and delay can be zero if you so choose. It enter, they enter the entire sample time that they want to sample over and the number of cycles they want to break that sample into. And I've got one more slide that will help you understand that. The final mode is gas sampling mode, and when the end user wants to sample compressed gas, any type of inert compressed gas, most commonly would be something like nitrogen or argon, they can go into gas sampling mode. So very simple operation, constant, periodic, and gas sampling. We can choose the volume, and we actually have eight preset volumes to choose from. So 20 liters, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500, 700, and 1,000 liters. If the user has a customized volume of air they want to sample, it's very easy to change. All you do is hold down the button for one, less than literally one second, and you are allowed to go in and enter whatever sample volume that you so choose. So these are preset volumes. However, you can come in and enter a custom mode, and that mode will save, or that volume will save as one of these buttons. So eight preset sample volumes that are fully customizable. So periodic mode, again, let's take a look at periodic mode because it can be a little confusing. The, enter, the user enters the sample volume to be sampled. So in this case, let's say most common is sample 1,000 liters or one cubic meter. They can enter delay time, the total periodic sample time. This includes the sample plus pauses and the number of cycles. So while I take a drink here, you can just soak up this awesome information. Now you may be asking yourself out there in listener land, why would a user want to break up a sample? Well, Great question. I'm going to answer that question for you right now. So let's say, for example, I have an aseptic process that lasts four hours. Well, common sample volume is 1,000 1, liters or one cubic meter. This instrument samples at 100 liters a minute, so it would take a 10-minute sample to achieve 1,000 liters or one cubic meter. Now, as a user, I may want to mint, I may want to sample throughout the entire filling process, which again, let's say lasts four hours. One plate will last up to four hours, but 
you can still only pull a cubic meter of air. So what I want to do is I want to put my viable sampler in, I want to put my petri dish in or my auger plate, and I want it to sample a cubic meter, but I want to spread that cubic meter out over a four hour period. So we can see here, we'll take a sample, we'll have a hold time, another sample, a hold time, a sample, a hold time, a sample, a hold time, all the way through, in this particular case, I think we have written here two hours, but we can use two hours or four hours over this entire sample period. So this reduces the number of times I have to change my plate, which obviously reduces the number of interventions, which thus reduces the potential for inducing contamination into my environment. So this is what we call periodic sampling. When we put the instrument in gas sampling mode, this allows us to sample compressed gases. This is another advantage that, yes, some companies have, and yes, some companies don't have. So we can use our viable sampler to sample ambient conditions, but also sample compressed gas. And it's an extremely easy thing to use. You can see here at the top of our instrument, we have our gas sampling impaction head. This piece here connects with a piece of tubing to the gas sampling, uh, to the gas being sampled. We have an adjustment knob here on the upper right that allows us to adjust the flow. This screen here is what helps us to understand is our flow adjusted properly. So we've given the customer a very easy to use gauge that shows them that the adjustments that they've made are in tolerance. And we show here intolerance means plus minus 5% flow. So essentially, we connect to a gas system, we turn on the gas, we adjust to make sure we're in tolerance, and we hit start. So it's a very simple thing to use, gas sampling options for inert gases. Um, we have up to 50 unique usernames that can be entered into the Active Count 100H, Active Count and Active Count 100H. That's down here under the user section, which looks like the silhouette of two people. So you can enter up to 50 usernames. Each name can be up to 16 characters long, and you can choose a combination of letters numbers, and a few specific signs. We've, we have a slide, so it allows you for quick access to all the different users. So 50 users, 16 characters long. Once this is entered, it stays in the system and it doesn't need to be re-entered again. User location names, so location menu. This the location menu is the icon in the bottom right hand corner of the main home screen that looks like a, a standard map icon on top of a map. We allow we have the user can allow enter up to 400 unique location names. Each location name again can be 16 characters long and it can be a combination of letters and numbers and we have a slider for quick uh, quick selection. So 400 location names, 16 characters long. Easy to use status screens. So the active count 100H, we built intelligence into the instrument to make it as easy as possible for our customers. So the unit will automatically notify the user if a, when a sample is complete. We can see here, sample is complete. If a sample has been aborted, which means you, you, you are manually aborting a sample. If flow in the sample was not adequate, so there's a flow issue, or if your battery is dropped down to a level that you're not able to complete the sample. So let me give you an example. Let's say my battery life is getting low. I need to take one more sample of a cubic meter. However, the unit will know if I don't have ample battery life left, the unit will notify me in advance of taking that sample. This helps to stop getting halfway or two-thirds of the way through a sample and having the battery die. 
So we want to make sure, again, we've designed this with intelligence to make it as easy as possible to use. There is security. So there is an onboard password. Uh, we call it a configuration password that will lock out the configuration screen. So once all of your sampling parameters have been entered into the unit, you can add a password for security and that will keep other users from changing the sampling parameters. So here we can enter a password up to 16 characters long and it could be a combination of numbers, uh, a dash, a number sign, or letters. And all you need to do to enable the password is just swipe to the right. We've now enabled the password. So again, single password for the instrument and it can be up to 16 characters long. We have a, a sample log, which is in the upper left-hand corner. This shows you the last sample taken. It gives you the start date, the start time, the location that was sampled, the user who was logged into the instrument, the sample duration, the flow duration, the volume of air, the cycles that were taken. So this obviously was in periodic mode because it took five samples of the course to, uh, to get a complete um, cubic meter of air, and the overall status for the instrument was okay. Now, if the user wants to save off this information, all they need to do is plug in an extremely small USB key that is provided with the instrument into the back of the instrument, and they have essentially unlimited recording of this sample log. Once they can, they pull out the USB key, they can plug this into any computer and pull off this data as a CSV file. So storage is essentially unlimited with the USB key. And again, they're recording your date, time, location, who was logged in as the user, sample duration, sample volume, cycles, and instrument status. That's all part of the sample log. One of the very unique features of the Active Count 100H is its removable, autoclavable petri dish holder. And we have actually filed for a patent on this, on this particular function. So let me explain. You can see here, several of our competitors have this similar petri dish holder. However, it is not removable. So imagine as a microbiologist or quality assurance person to properly decontaminate this instrument, I actually have to clean underneath this area, underneath this ring. So now I have to take, pretty much I have to take Q-tips, dip them in some type of biodecontamination solution, and I have to swab underneath this plate for proper decontamination. That is time consuming and questionable at best from effect, an effective standpoint. We have a autoclavable, removable, basically it's magnetically uh, attached, so it's very simple to remove. Once I remove this, look how easy it is to clean this area. So easier cleaning, more effective cleaning, it reduces cleaning time, and, oh, by the way, this plate is autoclavable. So they can take this plate and throw it into an autoclave. This is a really key function or feature for us, and it is patent pendant. The unit is wipe downable. And so, again, wipe downable joints, wipe downable touchscreen, sealed power switch sealed power and USB port in the back, so the unit is completely wiped downable. Also, we ship the unit with a blower inlet seal. So, when the user removes the plate, we, we provide them with a 316L stainless steel blower inlet seal that now allows them to easily wipe down this environment without getting any type of contamination into the instrument. Again, rounded corners and seams, seamless enclosure, all add to the ease of wipe down ability, which obviously means it's compatible with the environments that it's sampling in. 
We have a gas sampling option for the unit, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. The gas sampling option is compatible with the Active Kent 100 and Active Kent 100H. Um, it, can, it has a pressure range of 20 to 145 psi. I have never met a customer site that didn't fall within this range. It is 316L stainless steel. It is autoclavable. It has an O-ring seal down here at the bottom, which allows a very airtight connection to the sampler, so you're not aspirating air outside of the gas sampling, and it does inert gases. So this is the gas sampling option. We also have a remote sampling option. So for customers that don't want to put the viable sampler inside of their critical environments, we have a remote sampler. This only works with the active count H, uh, 100H. It is 316 stainless, autoclavable, has an O-ring seal, and you can use up to 10 feet of tubing. So this is a great example that was provided by Marcel. Thank you very much, Marcel and Martin. So you can see here, we have our isokinetic probe, we have our stand or monopod, sample tubing, and then impacting onto the surface. So this is our remote sampling option. So competitive overview, and this picture is very apropos, right? So let's go smash the competition. So really our main competitors in the industry are the SAS 100, which is the standard yellow looking sampler, the MBV Mass 100, the PMS Minicap 100, and the MTech unit. All of these have a 100 liter a minute sample flow rate. In the US, the two biggest market competitors are really the SAS and the MBV. I would roughly estimate that between these two companies, they probably own 60 to 70 percent of the US market. The beautiful part about that is guess what? Neither of these two competitors has a HEPA filtered exhaust. So when they claim ISO 14698 compliance, it is not true. They're claiming compliance for a specific selected part of ISO 14698. So if you want true compliance, you need to have HEPA filtered exhaust. So Lighthouse has HEPA filtered, PMS and MTEC does. We have a 316 stainless steel body. SAS does not, they're plastic. Uh, MBV is aluminum, PMS is plastic, and MTech is plastic. So plastic, as I'm hopefully all of you or most of you are aware, does not nearly hold up as well. It gets micro abrasions and scratches, which are potential sources for where micro contamination can actually grow and hang out. Makes it also difficult to clean. Our unit ships with a standard 316L stainless steel head. The SAS does, the MBV, it's an optional item and it is more money. The PMS unit comes standard with stainless and the MTEC comes only with aluminum. We have a touchscreen interface. The SAS or the MBV does not, PMS does and the MTEC does removable petri dish holder. We're the only company that has a removable patent pending petri dish holder. Gas sampling option, we do. The SAS does. The MBV, it's actually a separate device. So if you have a customer that's looking for a single device that can do both environmental sampling of microbes and they want to test compressed gases, which they absolutely should be, then they would have to purchase a separate whole device if they want the MBV unit. PMS and MTEC both have gas sampling options. Remote sampling options, um, SAS has a separate device. MBV doesn't even offer something. PMS has one and MTEC does not. Battery life. Now you'll notice I have a little asterisk here. Battery life is based on continuous sampling at 100 liters a minute. We have 
one of the longest battery lives in the industry at eight hours. SAS claims seven, P uh, MBV is eight, PMS claims five, and MTEP claims six. I want to explain something to you. This is critical. On the PMS data sheet, they actually claim six hours of battery life, but as tricky as they normally are, they state based on normal operation. And they define normal operation as a 10 minute sample in a five minute hold. So essentially, they're picking up five minutes every sample and showing a six hour battery life. But in reality, we're here, we're talking about continuous sampling. And I have estimated that that would be a five hour sample life. So we really have one of the longest battery lives in the industry. Onboard location names, we have 400 usernames. SAS does not, MBV does not. Now, they do offer a separate software package that you can have usernames, but that is not on board the instrument. PMS does and MTEC does. The unit, is it suitable for aseptic environments where you could actually take the instrument and put it in a lath or BSC or isolator? The answer is yes. And really the main reason is A, we are stainless, B, we are HEPA filtered, we don't re-aspirate air. We're, we are isokinetic, so we have very little disruption of airflow, of unidirectional airflow. And you can see SAS because of no HEPA filter, MBV because of no HEPA filter is not. So we can truly claim ISO 14698 compliance where the two biggest competitors cannot because the lack of the HEPA filter. So summary, the instrument is compliant with industry guidelines, HEPA filtered exhaust, D50 of 1.05 micron, and we do not re-aspirate air. We are compatible with our customers' environments with stainless steel and a PTFE coating over our anodized hardened aluminum, sealed front and rear panels, it's compatible with commonly used biodecontamination materials. We are isokinetically sampling. And by far, we are the easiest instrument to use on the market. We have a touchscreen interface, icon-driven menu. We offer continuous periodic and gas sampling options. 400 location labels, each 16 characters long. 50 usernames, each 16 characters long and patent pending removable autoclavable petri dish holder. This is our ship kit so that you clearly understand when a customer purchases a unit, this is exactly what they will receive. So they will get a 316L stainless steel dust cover that sits on top of the sampling head. They will get a 316L stainless steel sampling head, the removable autoclavable a base plate or petri dish holder. They will get an adjustment tool that adjusts the little arms to adjust the, for the width of the petri dish because dishes come in slightly different sizes. They will get an eight gigabyte flash drive, the stainless steel blower inlet seal, the threaded tripod adapter, power supply, operation manual, calibration certificate, and it even comes in its own beautiful carrying case. So this is a standard ship kit. This is what the unit comes complete with. You guys are probably saying to yourself, man, this thing is awesome. I am gonna kick competitor ass. Ass being a technical term in this point. So the Active Count 100H is 14698 compliant, HEPA filtered exhaust, continuous periodic sampling modes. It has removable Petri dish holder. It is suitable for aseptic conditions. We have remote and gas sampling options integrated into the instrument. So remember, as Dr. Kim, our leader, our CEO and founder of Lighthouse says, is you have the power to fulfill your dreams. This product is an absolute winner in this market. Two to one, remember that. Two viable samplers are sold for every one portable instrument. All right, guys. 
Tom, let's open it up for some questions, and then we're going to jump into our quote template after that. But let's address the questions that we just covered in this presentation. So if you can open up the um, ability for the end users to ask questions, Tom, let's roll with that next. Peter, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Good. Uh, we do have a few questions. I've been answering them as we go along. And I will open up. I tried opening up uh, everybody at the same time, but there was a lot of background noise, so I shut it back down. I will open up one at a time as we have questions. There are some outstanding questions that uh, maybe you can address right away. That would be the question. One question from Brent uh, was 21 CFR compliance. Does that uh, come into play on portable units? So that's a very tricky question and something that will come up. Um, the answer is 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, viable samplers can't truly be completely compliant. And the reason for that is the, uh, the key information for the viable sampler is the CFU count, colony forming unit count. Well, that information has to get manually entered. So there's no way to make that 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. Now also remember that the user, um, not in every situation, but in some situations, will hand write onto the Petri dish. So they will, if they're not printing labels, they have to hand write onto the Petri dish to label it so they know what location they sample. That is not 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. Again, when they incubate the sample, which remember, you have to incubate for 24 to 72 hours at a minimum, and actually can be up to two weeks, depending if you're looking for very specific microbes. Um, when that gets done and you do your CFU count, also that is not 21 CFR Part 11 compliant. So, so the answer to the question today is no. Other questions? Can you can you hear me? I can Peter? hear you now. Okay. Well, that that would hold true for all of our competitors as well, correct? That's you true. I mean, okay. unless the only way that I can think of that it possibly could be um, 215. I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> uh, it can be 21 CFR Part 11 compliant is if after incubating the plate. They had an optical system, which does exist, that could uh, go ahead and automatically count the CFUs, and then that data would get logged into, let's say, a LIMS laboratory information management system. At that point, you could plus, if that same system generated um, a, a printout to label the Petri dishes, now that, combined with um, an appropriate output from the viable sampler could possibly be considered compliant. Okay. Randy Woodham lot. has... Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. No, no, I'm done. Go ahead. Okay. Randy Woodham had asked, what are the size uh, plates that uh, are used inside uh, of these? This unit takes a 90 millimeter plate plus minus, I believe, 2 millimeters. So it'll go like, you know, 88 to 92. So plates, standard plates are 90 millimeter, and uh, these plates do vary by manufacturer. So we gave a tolerance, um, and that's why earlier in this presentation we showed an adjustment here. I'm trying to actually get back there. This Petri dish adjustment tool allows you to adjust these, um, the, the width of these holders to give you a little variance for uh, the dish. Now there are some companies, but there are, I would say it's very few, although Randy did happen to run into one company that wanted to use a 60 millimeter plate. That's a contact plate. That is normally used for looking at uh, microbial contamination on the surface or on a gown, and it is uncommonly used for an impactor. So the answer is no, this does not handle 60 millimeter Rodak plates, but it does handle the common 90 millimeter plate. 
do we have pricing on the competitors' uh, products? And this is from Ricardo. Um, the the answer is um, we have some pricing, um, not in this presentation. We're continually gathering more pricing. I can tell you for sure that we are priced. Um, I would even say not even on the middle end of the market. Our unit is priced highly competitively on the lower side of pricing right now, which means let's say the mass 100 can range anywhere from about $6,500 to $8,500 depending on features and so forth. Um, this unit, the Active Count 100H, we have a special introductory price of $4,500. Its base price is $5,000, but for the next six months, will be providing us an introductory price of $4,500. So from a price standpoint, we are extremely price competitive. The last question we have before you go to the quote template, uh, which uh, I think we all know will be available today uh, to all of our channel. Uh, how often is the HEPA filter changed out or required to be changed out inside this unit? So it's it's so guys, it's going to depend highly on the environments that it's sampling in. Obviously, for most of our customer base, at a bare minimum, you're going to be in ISO seven or eight environment, and a lot of times ISO five. So we're estimating somewhere between two to three years. Now remember, filters get better with age, right? Like wine or like me. Ha ha ha! That was a joke, everybody. So they get better with age. So it's not that you would need to change out a filter because it's not working anymore. It's that the, the pressure drop across the filter would be um, prohibitive for achieving flow rate. Now these instruments have auto flow control. So that is already built inside. So if there is some level of flow restriction, the unit will auto compensate. So that's a key. So how long will that auto compensate? Is there a, a readout that gives the uh, the level where it gets into the marginal range? Uh, yeah, that's, I mean, so there's a, there is a flow sensor that is internal of the instrument that will control flow flow to plus minus four percent. Once it goes beyond that love, uh, level, there is an indicator on the main screen. There's a flow indicator, and I'm trying to get to the main screen here. It will give you a little easier to point it out. So here on the flow screen, this there's a flow indicator. So when the flow is out of tolerance, the user will be notified both on the data that they can save and directly on the screen. Plus, don't forget, we have a flow status right here. So flow error. So if there is a flow error, you will also get this big red and white X button on the front of the unit. So the ample, the answer is yes. So that flow status then will tell you if the HEPA filter is uh, is uh, requiring changing versus just the airflow coming in through certainly air in, air out. But uh, well, uh, that won't not, specifically tell you that is the, the reason, right? It's not going to specifically tell you that the HEPA filter needs to be changed. Yeah. It's just going to tell you that. Uh, maybe the blowers something have wrong with the flow. Okay. Correct. Okay. Something wrong with the flow. And then, and the last one, so I know you need to get to the next section. A couple more questions have come up that, that relates to this. Do we know what it cost is to have? You, know, you can't change this out in the field. Uh, a simple replacement. You, in other words, you're not going to buy a HEPA filter and then change it out in the field. Is that done during a service? Of, if it comes back in for calibration or come back in for service at Lighthouse? Yeah. There. <laughs> That will be evaluated during service or during the calibration of the instrument, and we'll get that. I don't have that pricing today, but we'll get we'll have that pricing for you by end of next week. Okay, I think that is the questions. Uh, lead times we're talking right now. That's uh, one from Brent. Just uh, curious about lead times uh, currently on the Active Count 100H. So the Active Count lead times right now. Um, the goal is to keep the lead time down to no longer than two weeks. Right now, the lead time is three weeks presently, but we expect by the end of this month, we'll have that down to two weeks or less. Okay, and one last question from Randy just came in. Uh, is there a field customer calibration kit available? 
Um, today there is no field customer calibration kit available. We will do in, we can do in field calibration, but there's nothing that we can just ship to the customer that would um, allow the customer to calibrate himself. Okay. That's it for the questions on this side. Uh, if anyone else has questions now during the next phase, I'll continue to answer and then we'll open it up one last time at the very end. So go ahead, uh, Peter, you can come oh, to the next slide. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very quickly just jump to our website and then we will go to the quote template. So www.golighthouse.com. So this product is actually already on our website. You can see here it's featured here in our rolling banner ad. If we go to microbial samplers and we can go to active count and we can see that we've got both samplers listed here and we can come down to product configurator we can choose the active count 100H and it's already up on the website and you can see all of the features you can also download a data sheet from the website um, on the product and so we can go through that process right now and so there's your official data sheet. We'll make that a little larger for everybody. And essentially the data sheet covers all of the details that we just went over. It talks about self-adjusting flow control to ensure accurate sample volumes, continuous and periodic sampling modes. And then if you come to the back of the data sheet, you know, it's got the actual physical dimensions of the sampler. Um, it talks about the flow rate. This is 19 meters a second is the flow rate through each sampling hole on the top of the impactor plate. We have 316L stainless steel, adjustable and autoclavable. And I, I apologize, it actually handles 85 to 92 millimeter plates, eight programmable volume presets, 50 programmable usernames, 400 programmable location names and down the page here. So um, shows you what the ship kit includes, which we covered earlier in the presentation, and then the size and weight of the instrument. And it talks about eight hours of continuous sampling or 10 hours of normal sampling use. And again, because one of our competitors stated this, we decided to state it as well. So we state a 10 minute sample and a five minute pause will get you a 10 hour of normal operation use for the viable sampler. Um, something else I wanna point out on our website, um, just so that you are aware of it, is um, let's go back to the home screen. And um, Jason Kelly has written a great article on viable sampling under here, how to select the right air sampler you click on this, and it actually will take you to a Clean Rooms Technology magazine. Let me see if I can make this a little larger for you. And this was an article that was recently published um, in this Clean Room Technology magazine. And this was authored by our very own Jason Kelly, which you can see here on the left-hand side. And this goes into the details of microbial sampling and how to pick a sampler. And this is available on our website and on the Clean Rooms Magazine website. Um, when, we, when Tom sends out the package of information, which will include the quote template, the PowerPoint presentation, it will also include this technical paper. I highly suggest that everybody take the time to read through this. It will cover a lot of what we just covered um, as far as the standards, ISO 14698, It'll talk about physical and biological efficiency, um, and then we'll go into the impaction, which we talked about the D50, and uh, the impaction rate. This, this particular picture is not a lighthouse picture. This is a general article, so we've picked um, a different, um, different competitor's impaction rate. Uh, this, however, is specific for lighthouse because we're showing how the instrument actually works, where air samples through the impactor, impacts onto the dish. So this tech paper, which again you will get um, with the uh, package that Tom sends out, is also a great thing to send out to potential customers. So you can introduce the product, you can either send them to the website um, or send them a data sheet 
And then from a follow-up standpoint, this is a great article to lead them to or to send them. So sort of bolster um, Lighthouse's capabilities and we're already publishing technical articles um, on viable sampling. So again, that's available on our website and you can find that in the Knowledge Center under Technical Papers. So if you come right here, this talks about impaction technology, that's the same article. So that is available on our website. Now let's go to the quote template. And we'll make this bigger so everybody can see it. So this quote template, we've used our standard quote template so everybody should understand how to fill this out. We've got our complete description of the product here. So we talk about the D50, the HEPA filtered exhaust. Um, it is, uh, can be put into BSEs and laminar flow benches. So the introductory price is $4,500, and that includes the stainless steel sampling head and dust cover. So to fill this out, we could enter a one. That fills in our $4,500. Um, this next section highlights what the ship kit comes with. So, um, and again, in the PowerPoint presentation, you can see all of the items, um, but this is a description of those items. Um, you can see the power supply is auto switching, so it's 110 to 220 volt, 50 to 60 hertz. And if you're selling outside the US, um, you can choose the plug style that you would like. If you want to buy extra ship kit items, these are all listed here um, by uh, by, by unit and price. So you can buy an extra carrying case or power cord. And then we have the additional accessories. We have the compressed gas sampler, which is only $695. We have the uh, sampling head with dust cover. So if a customer wanted to buy a second sampling head and dust cover, they could buy a second sampling head and dust cover. They could also buy a, a remote sampling kit that remote sampling kit, so remember for remote sampling, we can actually go back to the presentation, make sure you understand what that looks like. That was this slide here where a customer wants to do remote sampling. The remote sampling kit comes with the isokinetic probe, the sampling stand, and the sample tubing, and the sampling head. That comprises the remote sampling kit, or if they want, they can actually purchase the items separately. So they can purchase the remote sampling head, they can purchase the isokinetic probe, and they can purchase the stand separately and the tubing. The final item is the IQ-OQ validation documents. They can purchase a set of those, and you can see here the total price. Um, we are offering a two-year warranty on the unit, which also gives us a competitive advantage. So that we've kept the uh, quote template also very simple to fill out and use, and it's our standard quote template format. So this will be getting sent out along with the presentation, along with the technical paper. Um, and then if um, you have your own company website, I know like Acumen has their own company website, uh, we can also provide some high resolution pictures for you that you can load uh, pictures of the active count 100 and 100H onto the website. So I think, Tom, we can open it up for additional questions at this point. Okay. Well, let's see. Uh, we have one question from Brent. Uh, do we have a presentation for customers on the active count 100H? Um, we have this nice presentation, but do we have one that we can present to customers? I don't know why you couldn't present this one without with just a few slide modifications. I will um, well, after that the, would be it. That would be the thing. We should send out then one that is just specifically for our sales channel to present to customers. Right. We'll, we'll take out you know this two to one. Obviously, it doesn't need to be there, but I would suggest that from an education standpoint, a lot of customers are not aware of things like USP 116 or ISO 14698. So I would highly suggest leaving this information in and becoming comfortable with it. Once you're comfortable with it, a lot of even competitors don't fully understand this standard. And so we've tried to break it down and boil it down to something very simple. Um, so we will um, 
add a couple more slides to this, and this will get sent out again today. Um, the slides that we will add, I will add something on the flow control, and I'll add just a summary slide um, about the instrument itself. But I think from a technical standpoint, we want you to follow this presentation because, again, you're setting the standards by asking these three questions. Um, is my sampler uh, compliant with industry guidelines? Is my sampler compatible for my environment? And how easy is my sampler to use and maintain? I really want to emphasize these questions because they create the playing field and you force the competitors to play our game. So please do your best to follow this presentation. Um, we'll send it out in PowerPoint form so that you could, um, if you felt the need, obviously to remove or change, uh, really remove, you shouldn't be modifying any slides. You know, you may want to take out the competitor overview, but you very well may want to leave it in as well because it helps educate the customer. So this presentation will get sent out today with a couple amended slides. Uh, from Venancio, uh, the question is, if a customer buys several, do they need to buy more than one IQOQ? No. So well, one of them will be the same for each unit. Uh, they can just duplicate it uh, for each one. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And, and to further, things like the gas sampler or the remote sampler, it's universal. So they could buy 10 viable samplers, and the sampling heads will work across all 10. Okay. Uh, another question uh, from Randy, which I could answer. Uh, what about demo units? And so, the answer to that is uh, we do have uh, some demo units being made up right now. We will have available uh, probably in the next uh, couple of uh, week or two. Um, however, they will be in limited supply, and they will circulate around to each location. So there may be an opportunity that you want to show it, and there won't be a demo unit available necessarily. Uh, we do have that plan for uh, anyone who feels that this would be a, uh, a unit that would be shown quite a bit, which we hope it will. But we do have our 50% off purchase policy uh, that uh, you can purchase at 50% off. Uh, and keep as your own demo unit. That is the other option. Or you could certainly wait for one to become available. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter, do you have anything else uh, to add to that? Nope. I mean, I think I think that this product um, it has the competitive advantages we need. It is priced highly competitively, and you know, honestly, as a salesperson, I want one of these things in my trunk, and I want to bring it into every single customer site. And hey, Peter. Um, Yes. Sorry, just real quick while I'm unmuted. Um, there's a launch package for this that includes a data sheet, a presentation, a quote template. Are you going to review that with everybody where they can find that information? It, well, Tom is going to email it to everybody today. Okay, but it's going to be on the distributor site as well? Correct. Sorry, yeah. It'll, all that information will also be uploaded to the distributor site. Okay, because when you were talking about the presentation just now, it sounded like you were you know, just so I'd like to address this to everybody. You know, Peter was saying, well, it'd be nice if you could keep this slide in the presentation or take, you know, take this out. We're going to give you a presentation that is the message that you should deliver. And so we're not authorizing any modifications of the presentation. So we want to craft the message. Obviously, you can skip through slides and what have you, but we believe it's really important to have a consistent message that no matter who sees or hears, a lighthouse presentation the message is the same we think a lot about um, what to talk about what questions to drive the customer to ask such that you know they're thinking with us you know we want to control the conversation in in, in all situations so um, please don't modify these presentations because what ends up happening is you end up with five six seven ten presentations and you can't believe how like crazy everything gets so if you'd like a modification to the presentation, the process for everybody is just to send an email to Peter and let him know, Peter, I think it's too long, or Peter, I think we should you know, add, um, add a few slides here. We will modify, put it on the distributor site, 
so that you guys can access it. So um, you don't have to rely on your email and searching through your email. You just know you can go to the distributor website, partner at partner.golighthouse.com. Is that right, Tom? Correct. And then um, partner.golighthouse.com and, and be able to access all this information from wherever you are. So I just wanted to clarify that one point. And what Paul is mentioning right now is what we also followed when we launched the Apex R and the uh, Apex P. We had a set message uh, that we had in our presentation, and it worked really well. Every time we won went in front of a customer, we kept that same message, and it really rolled really well in front of the customer, and, and we did control the conversations in that. Uh, we have a lot of presentations uh, over the years, and I would say that when we got to the Apex presentations in that format, and this one follows very similar to that, to the Apex format, it really uh, uh, benefited all of us in, in fact, in, in having that set message uh, presented by us and everybody. So. Correct. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So, Peter, why don't you follow up this with, um, if you're going to send an email to everybody, then just have a description and links to the partner site so that they can get on and access all the uh, all the latest information. You got it. Any other questions, comments? I mean, it this looks is like it looks like we are good. Okay. I don't well, see any additional questions coming up at this point. Um, I, I guess one more comment that I would like to make is we've actually already sold, I believe, I think the number is 30. Marcel um, has sold 30 of these to Novo Nordisk. We went head-to-head -head with the PMS Minicap 100, and um, they chose Lighthouse, and this is at their headquarters uh, at, at Novo. So 30 units actually already shipped at the end of this month, um, actually shipped a week ago to Novo Nordisk. So we already have a customer base for the active count 100H, and we have a big customer reference name. Okay, uh, the last thing that I see coming in is from Randy Woodham. And he says, great presentation, great product, with a lot of ex ex exclamation points. I mean, guys, engin you know, engineering and, 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 and the team here at Lighthouse really did put a lot of thought um, into this. You know, um, Paul Newman, Marcel, Martin, um, a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into designing this product, researching the competition so that we could come out with something that we really could dominate this market. So it's a phenomenally priced, it's phenomenally featured, um, it's by far the easiest instrument on the, in, on, on, the, on the market to use, it is ISO 14698 compliant, and um, you guys are armed and dangerous, come back to us for support, but um, let's go make some money guys. Plain and simple. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you, Peter, for a great presentation. And uh, we'll get this information in everybody's hands and move forward. Go Lighthouse. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for your participation. Go Lighthouse! Woohoo! Thank you. Have a good day. Any, any questions, just give me an email or Peter. And if it's bad, give it to Peter. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.